Hi folks, welcome back. I hope you're all doing well. Today I want to take a look at a paper that explains the design principles behind the Plan 9 operating system from Bell Labs. Now this is the same place where Unix was developed and Plan 9 in some sense is the spiritual successor to Unix. Now obviously even by the time that Plan 9 started, Unix was already quite successful and quite popular. However, a couple of major developments, things like graphics and networking and distributed computing, were things that were added to Unix after the fact. And in some sense, one of the main design goals of Plan 9 is to develop an operating system environment where these things are first-class design constraints as opposed to things that got added later on. The authors of Plan 9 also wanted to build a centrally administered time-sharing system, but one that was constructed out of various distributed parts. One of the core ideas they actually carried forward from Unix was the use of a file system to not just name, but also access all kinds of resources, even things that are not typically files, things like devices and so on. This is actually one of the central abstractions around which a lot of Plan 9 is built, this idea of treating literally everything as a file. The authors wanted to come up with new abstractions and see how they could use those to build a system that was qualitatively different. And so backwards compatibility with Unix and POSIX was not a design goal. Let's look at the three main design principles of Plan 9. The first one is that all resources are named and they are accessed like files in a hierarchical file system. The second principle is to have one standard protocol, which they call 9P, for accessing these resources. And it is the same protocol that's used to access these resources, whether they are local or remote. And the third design principle, which is what we use to compose things and compose a computing environment, is that various disjoint hierarchies that are provided by various different services are joined together into a single private hierarchical file namespace. So the way you construct your local private computing environment in Plan 9 is by choosing which publicly visible network resources you want to pull into your local file namespace essentially by mounting them into your local file namespace. And once you do that, you can just treat everything as files. One example of this is how you handle processes. In Plan 9, all processes have a file entry under the slash proc file system. You get information about all the processes running on your system by looking at the files under slash proc, and every process has information that you can read about it by reading that specific process file. You can also make changes by writing to these process files, things like changing priorities or perhaps even killing the process. You might notice that modern Linux systems have stolen this idea from Plan 9 and have their own version of the slash proc file system. Note that concerns like protection and access naturally fall out of the file system itself because each file has its own permissions. This idea is carried over to the graphical windowing system as well, which is called 8.5. Each window gets access to devices like the mouse and the bitmapped graphical display and the terminal via all these device files. Contrast this with X, which is the windowing graphical system used on most Unix variants, where the networking is very explicit. On the other hand, an eight and a half application window sees the same device and bitmap graphics and console files, and it doesn't know whether they are local or remote. The networking is very transparent. Different windows may be running programs on different machines over the network, but they all see the same namespace. In Plan 9, there is no dedicated FTP program. Instead, the way you do FTP on Plan 9 
is to convert the FTP protocol into 9P. And once you've converted it to 9P, you can treat it as just any other file server and then mount it into your local file system hierarchy. And now the remote FTP server appears as just another place on your file system. And you can use all the local tools you have, all the usual tools you have, like copy and grep and diff and so on, on this remote FTP site. You can use the same idea to use remote CPUs as well, except in this case, you're mounting your local resources into the hierarchical file system of the compute server. This way, all your local device files are visible remotely on this remote compute server. You're effectively starting a shell on the remote CPU server, but this shell has access to all your local devices and all your local files. Note that this is a much richer environment than something like remote login and or remote SSH, which gives you an environment on the remote CPU server, but that remote CPU server is not seeing all your local resources in a transparent manner. Note how all these various distributed computing scenarios are falling out very elegantly out of this design principle of making everything a file and then accessing all these resources via one uniform protocol, which is 9P. Interestingly, Plan 9 was one of the first operating systems to consistently and pervasively use Unicode and they even invented the UTF encoding for Unicode. And UTF-8 is backwards compatible with ASCII and of course now is used all over the place, much beyond Plan 9 as well. Plan 9 itself is portable across various architectures and runs on various architectures, but because it is distributed at its core, you can construct your environment out of heterogeneous architectures. Maybe the Windows system is running on Intel, but you could connect to a CPU server on a totally different architecture and run programs over there. The file-based method of accessing everything also simplifies your system call interface a lot by simply eliminating a ton of system calls. The example they use here is for reading the time. There's a file slash dev slash time which presents the system clock. So you don't need a time library function or a time system call into the kernel. You simply use this file. You simply read it to get the current time and then format it in a human readable way if you want to print it out. The way you construct your local hierarchical file system out of a bunch of distributed resources is using three main system calls, mount, bind, and unmount. Mount attaches a new hierarchy into your existing namespace. Bind does about the same thing, but it duplicates an existing namespace. And unmount, like its name says, undoes the effect of a mount or a bind. Now, one really interesting thing is that when you bind or mount, you can do so with multiple directories at a single point in the namespace. They call this a union directory. This is really interesting because when you try to look for a file in a union directory, you look for each part of a union in turn and the first match is returned. So for example, the slash bin directory, which contains all your executable programs, is a union of all the program binaries for the CPU type you're running on, plus all your shell scripts, and then perhaps a bunch of directories that contain the user's programs. In traditional Unix systems, you would handle this kind of thing using the shell path environment variable, but that construction is totally unnecessary because you can just union mount all these things into one slash bin directory. Another example of simplification comes from controlling devices by treating them as files. For example, writing this specific string to this device file to set the speed of that device. 
On Unix, you would typically do this using an ioctal system call. But again, on Plan 9, this kind of system call is unnecessary because the unifying abstraction is reading and writing to files as a mechanism for controlling devices. Now, at the time, the authors did some performance comparisons of Plan 9 against SGI's IRIX Unix variant, and both were running on an SGI machine. And as you can see here, Plan 9 is pretty competitive with a heavily engineered commercial Unix system in terms of things like time taken for context, which is how much time a system call takes, time taken to fork a process, latency and bandwidth of pipes, and so on. And the 9P protocol, which is the uniform RPC mechanism throughout the system, itself is pretty simple. As the authors say over here, it's very easy to write a 9P server and the boilerplate code for dealing with all the 9p messages is only about 500 lines. As the authors say over here, the goal of building the system was to support the other research being done by the authors rather than being the subject of research itself. The authors use it for their daily work and not just as a research tool. This is very reminiscent of the spirit of the original Unix paper as well, where the authors in that paper mention how they managed to make Unix a good computing environment because they themselves used it every day. So that was a quick look at some of the design principles behind the Plan 9 operating system. I hope you enjoyed that and I will see you next time. Thank you very much.